This game is a good illustration of the importance of center and effective ways of fighting for it. The future world champion Mikhail Batvinik systematically improves his pieces until all of them completely occupy the center. This leads to a positional squeeze, as the enemy pieces get completely disorganized and cramped, and after getting the overwhelming positional advantage, Batvinik finishes the game with a brilliant combination. Batvinik's opponent, Stolberg, starts with d4, and Batvinik plays the Nimso Indian defense, bishop b4, e3, short castle, bishop d3, d5, and here instead of a natural knight f3, and from f3 the knight would control the important central square, Stolberg plays knight e2, which is a little bit passive. However, he had his point. From e2, the knight defends the second knight, and in case black exchanges on c3, white wouldn't be forced anymore to capture with the b-pawn, which would uh, damage the pawn structure on the queen side. Instead, white would simply capture on c3 with the second knight. But Vinik immediately attacks the center, c5, and after short castle, knight c6, developing the piece, uh, the exchange on d5 took place, and after that, white attacks the bishop. And of course, now it wouldn't make sense to capture on c3, because the knight will capture on c3. That's why Batvinik first captures on d4, attacking the knight in his turn. And after the c5 pawn disappeared, the bishop's way, the retreat diagonal, is open. And white simply captured on d4, after which black immediately equalizes. Instead, white had a very good chance to grab the initiative by capturing the bishop, leaving his knight under attack. And after this, instead of capturing the pawn, white had a strong move b5. This is the pawn sacrifice for the initiative. And in case black accepts the sacrifice, after bishop takes b2, for a sacrificed pawn, white would get a very good compensation. White would have the advantage of two bishops, and both bishops would be very strong. White would have the open a-file, exerting pressure. The b5 pawn would also exert pressure on black's queen side. The pawn on d5 would be weak and isolated, and white would also get a very good blockading square on d4. So for a pawn, definitely white would get a very good compensation. But instead of this, instead of capturing the bishop, white simply captures the pawn. And now the position is completely equal. So the bishop, now that the bishop's way is open, the bishop retreats to d6. And in case white makes the natural looking move, namely bishop g5, in order to pin the knight, that would run into a simple tactics. Bishop takes h2 check and knight g4 check with the discovered attack on the bishop. Next move, black would capture the bishop and win a pawn. That's why first white plays h3. And Batvinik plays in his turn h6 in order to prevent uh, bishop g5. And now instead of uh, natural developing moves su such as bishop e3 or rook e1, Stolberg decided to start the active play on the queen side, playing b4. However, this pawn advance has a serious drawback. It weakens the c-file and in general and also in particular it weakens the c4 square. Because now that the pawn moved away from b2, it, uh, it cannot move to b3 anymore to control the c4 square, and that means the c4 square will remain the eternal weakness. But Vinik continues his development, rook e8, getting control over the open file, queen b3, and a strong move, bishop e6. The move might look uh, very uh, simple, uh, however, it has a deep idea behind it. After bishop d2, Batvinik creates the queen and bishop battery, and he has created an immediate threat, namely the sacrifice on h3, and after g takes h, queen takes h3, black would create an immediate checkmating threats on h2. That's why white played f4, in order to close the dark squared bishop's diagonal. However, just like the b4 advance, the f4 advance also has the same drawback. Namely, the e4 square now, besides the c4 square, will also become eternally weak, because the pawns don't move back, and the pawn cannot move back to f3 to take under control the e4 square. So, as you will see, Batvinik will exploit these weaknesses extremely effectively. The main defender of these main weaknesses is, of course, the light-squared bishop. 
And now we can understand but Vinik's next move, bishop f5. So before occupying these squares, he wants to uh, exchange the defender, the main defender of uh, these squares, namely the light squared bishops. Bishop. Black is threatening simply to capture on d3. And in case white captures on f5, the queen, the black queen would be activated. It would be ideally placed on f5. That's why white defends his bishop. Queen d c2 threatening to capture on f5. Of course, here Batvini could have exchanged on uh, d3, which would have been also strong, but he decided to retain the pressure. Bishop e4, invading the e4 square. In case white captures on e4, black would get rid of his isolated pawn, capturing with the pawn. Now, instead of the isolated weak pawn on d5, black would have a very strong passed pawn. Besides that, the d-file would open and black would have a chance to exert pressure on white's isolated weakness on d4. And also, black would get a great blockading square on d5. That's why, of course, after bishop e4, white didn't capture the bishop. Instead, white plays b5, advancing the pawn even further. But now that the pawn moved away from b4, and from before the pawn controlled the a5 square and now the, the square is unguarded and the knight jumps on a has a chance to jump on a5 and from a5 of course it will occupy the weakened c4 square first batvinik exchanges finally exchanges the bishops which is in his favor of course and then knight a5 white plays knight g3 trying to defend the e4 square and, of course, knight c4 followed. And with tempo, the knight, together with the bishop, are attacking the weak pawn on uh, a3. And it might look that white has a chance to capture the pawn, to win a pawn, because the d5 pawn is defending the c4 knight. And in case white captures, after knight takes d5, the knight would be unguarded, and white can win a pawn. However, that would run into knight e3 with a fork, White would be forced to capture, and after rook takes e3, the invasion of the rook on the third rank would be decisive. The knight would be under attack, and Batvinik gives the following variation. After king h2, defending the knight, the second rook would, would be developed with tempo, attacking the queen. The queen wouldn't be able to move to d5 because of simple tactics. Rook takes g3, and bishop takes f4 with the discovered attack on the queen. That's why after rook c c8, the queen would be forced to move to a passive square. And after that, the second rook will invade the third rank, and that would simply be deadly. The knight would be under attack, and after it retreats, black can uh, immediately return the pawn, and after the queen moves, black can even sacrifice on h3, winning on the spot after queen takes h3 check and queen g4. Check if the king moves to the h file, that would lead to the immediate checkmate. And after king f2, simply rook f3 check. And after king uh, e1, bishop b4 check would be deadly. After the king moves, the rook on f1 would fall. So after knight c4, white doesn't have a chance to capture on d5. That's why, as the pawn on a3 is under attack, Stolberg retreats his bishop to defend the pawn. Now, Batvinik activates his last undeveloped piece, rook c8. So now the rook controls the c-file and reinforces the knight. And white already uh, has serious problems. White's position is critical. Black pieces are extremely active, while white doesn't have a plan. And white played simply rook a2. Now the bishop retreats to f8. The idea is to vacate the d6 square for the knight. And from d6, the knight, together with the second knight, will control the e4 square. And one of these knights will jump on uh, c4, and the rook will replace uh, the knight on c4. So one of these knights will jump on e4, and the c8 rook will move to c4. White plays a4, moving the pawn from the uh, moving away the pawn from the attack, and also defending the b5 pawn. However, Again, the pawn advance has a serious drawback. From a3, the pawn controlled the b4 square. And now that it moved to a4, b4 square is unguarded. And Batvinik immediately exploits that. The bishop returns to the queen side. 
Bishop b4, threatening simply to capture on c3, eliminating the defender of e4, and after queen takes c3, the queen would be uh, right under attack of the rook, and the knight would move to e3 with the double attack. The queen on c3 would be under attack, and the rook would be under attack. That's why this time the knight moves back, it retreats. So one by one, white pieces are forced to move uh, to the first rank. While black pieces become more and more active with every move, white pieces retreat and become very passive and squeezed. And now that the knight, which controls the e4 square, retreated, the knight, the black knight, invades the e4 square. So black completely occupied the center and white doesn't have any counterplay in the center. That's why white tries to create some active play on the king side first. f5. And now f6 uh, might be quite unpleasant. But Vinic exchanges on g3. And after queen takes g3, bishop d6 attacking the queen. Queen f3. Now f6 uh, is quite unpleasant. But there is a simple way to prevent it. Bishop e7 taking under control the f f6 square. And white played queen g3. Creating two threats. So queen g3 uh, is uh, pinning the g7 pawn. So that means white is threatening bishop takes h6 and also f6. And in case the bishop captures, the rook will capture. And the black won't be able to capture with the g pawn because it's pinned. But of course, bishop f6 followed, preventing f6 and attacking the d4 square. White decided to exchange the pawns. Bishop takes h6 and bishop takes d4. Because the pawn on d4 is isolated and weak, that's why probably white agreed to the exchange. However, the d4 pawn played an important role. First, it controlled the important e5 square, and second, it blockaded the d5 pawn. And now that this pawn disappeared, black gets the total control over the e5 square, and his d5 pawn has become mobile. And as you will see, this will be very important. So bishop takes d4, of course, came with check. That's why king moved to h1. And now white again is threatening to capture on g7. And after bishop takes g7, f6 would be deadly, creating uh, checkmating threats. And uh, black would immediately lose. But there is a simple defense. f6 blockading the pawn. Now it cannot move. And defending g7. So, white doesn't have any chance to increase the pressure on the king side to continue the attack. That's why the bishop retreats to uh, c1 again. And now the rook invades e4. Black pieces one by one occupy the center. Queen d3 and now knight e5. The knight is greatly placed on e5 with tempo attacking the queen. And by moving away from c4, the knight vacated the square for the rook. And after the queen retreats, finally rook c4. So the complete occupation of the center is achieved. While all black pieces are centralized and extremely active and harmoniously placed, and black pieces coordinate very well, white pieces are squeezed, they are placed on the first rank, and um, it's not clear how white is going to coordinate his pieces. Actually, it's probably impossible already. So, what to do? On the king side, white's uh, counterplay didn't work. So, in the center, of course, black is dominating. So, white cannot do anything in the center. That's why white tried to create some play on the queen side to continue the pawn advance. a5. But, of course, that doesn't have any prospects. Bishop uh, c5, b6, trying to open files, uh, the b file, the a file, but, of course, Batvinik doesn't uh, let it. a6, now both of these files will remain close. And now, probably, it would have been better for white to play either knight f2, moving the knight, the passive knight, closer to the king, to the king side, with tempo attacking the rook, or maybe even bishop a3, hoping to exchange the bishops, which might have um, eased the black's tremendous pressure. But instead, white made a decisive mistake. Knight b2, 
attacking the, another rook. However, the knight moved too far away from the king side. So, Batwinik now occupies the third rank, rook c3. Now, black has the total control over the third rank. Bishop d2 attacking the rook, rook b3 pinning the knight, which is quite unpleasant. That's why queen uh, c2 attacking the rook. But now the queen comes into play with great effect. Queen b5 defending the rook. The queen is very active and creating an immediate threat. The rook is under attack. That's why rook c1. White is threatening to capture on c5, but the bishop again retreats to f8. And it turns out that... There is nothing white can do to prevent the invasion of the second rook on the second rank, which would be simply deadly. In case white plays rook e1, for example, to prevent the invasion, that would lose on the spot after the exchanges and queen f1 check and after king uh, f uh, h2, simple tactics, the knight sacrifice, and after g takes f, that leads to checkmate after bishop d6 check, Bishop g3, the bishops are exchanged, and rook takes f3 check, followed by checkmate on h3, of course. That's why uh, white, instead of rook e1, played rook d1, but of course rook e2 followed. Now black rooks control both the third rank and the second rank. And the rook also is pinning the bishop, which is quite unpleasant. That's why queen c1 followed. And now that Batvinik's advantage has reached its maximum, black pieces are extremely active and white pieces are completely squeezed and disorganized, it's time to deliver the final blow. And you can pause the video and try to find Batvinik's combination. So, all white pieces are placed, are squeezed and cramped on the queen side and the king is all alone and that means the final blow must be delivered on the king side and the rook sacrifice followed rook takes h3 check completely destroying king's defense and the g pawn must move and that means the king is completely open now and as the d4 pawn disappeared white pawn disappeared as you remember and the d5 pawn has become mobile it moves to d4 and that was the final move of the game vacating the d5 square for the queen and there is nothing white can do to prevent it and after queen d5 check that would be deadly of course followed by checkmate on g2 that's why stolberg resigned and now i recommend watching the 16th game of the 1951 world championship match in which batvinik gave a master class in chess strategy and positional squeeze getting total domination over all enemy pieces but first like this video and subscribe as it's really helpful for the channel growth